All right. Should I go ahead? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Max, for that introduction. Um, I want to also thank the organizers for putting this together. Um, as we've seen the last year and a half, it has been extremely chaotic um, putting together uh, virtual conferences and really um, embracing what technology has to offer in, in this pandemic. So I wanna just do a quick shout out to the organizers for that. Um, my name is Jeanette Washington. And um, as Max said, I have a pretty lengthy <laughs> list of accolades, but I'm coming here today to talk to you all about developing through barriers. I'm really excited to technically be in Oklahoma and um, afterwards, I'm going to need to speak with someone about why Oklahoma is the Sooner State. Have no idea, but I'm sure you all will be happy to help me understand uh, why you all have been given that uh, unique name <laughs> out of all the names. So as I am pulling up my screen right now, so I can go ahead and present you all with some slides. Um, I am the first talk, so there is a lot weighing on me to make sure that this talk is superb and superior. <laughs> so um, just bear with me as I get everything pulled up here. And um, again, welcome to Tulsa's Web Developer Virtual Conference. It's Friday. I know a lot of us are really antsy, not only to learn more about this topic, but because we are excited about the weather this weekend here in Michigan, where I currently reside. We're going to be in the late 80s, early 90s. So we're looking forward to um, just being out safely um, and social distancing with uh, just joy in our hearts because it's finally warm outside. So who am I? After getting that uh, introduction, I wanted to also give you all a little bit of a background um, so that you have context around your speaker for today. So I'm an author. Uh, I am a Java developer. I am also a JavaScript teacher. And there is certainly a difference between the two, um, as a lot of you will know. Um, I've worked as a speech pathologist where I have um, single-handedly assisted those who have communication disorders and who also have language delays and um, who may have fluency issues. I am also the chief academic officer of a company called Barely Articulating. And I will be giving you all of my little links and info so that you can hop on over to my social platforms and engage with me there. I recently wrote a book called Technical Difficulties, Why Dyslexic Narratives Matter in Tech. And I wrote this book because I did a lot of travel around the world and I spoke with a lot of individuals who were working in tech and some who were a little apprehensive about potentially working in tech because they felt that they could not provide any um, benefits to a tech company or to the industry as a whole because they had a um, disability. They had dyslexia, um, they may have had autism, um, they had ADHD or Tourette syndrome or any other um, neurodiversity. And they felt like um, they would not be a good uh, candidate for a role in tech. So I do a lot of debunking that in this particular book. It can be found at Barnes and Nobles or at Amazon. And I also have the audible coming out um, in the spring. So with this talk, Developing Through Barriers, let's set some expectations and non-expectations. I love to do this because I want you all to know what you're getting into. What investment of time are you making and what will you gain from that time? So our expectations today, we're going to discuss intersectionality. We're going to gain some insight around neurodiversity. And then we're also going to glance at some accessibility practices that you can pick up and start using today. Um, some non-expectations will be that um, after leaving this talk, unfortunately, you will not become an expert, okay? So if that is what you signed up for, I am sorry to tell you that you will not leave here with a PhD of uh, intersectionality or neurodiversity. That may be another talk, but not this one. 
Next, another non-expectation is that I will not be prescribing cures to any disability. Um, a lot of the neurodiversities that we see don't necessarily need cures because they are unique qualifiers. All right, so we see this picture here and I want you all to take a moment and just glance at what's happening, take it in, make some space for understanding and process this. Um, if you are watching online, you can go ahead and comment as to what you're seeing here and what detriments does this hold? So I'm gonna explain this picture. So there is um, an assessor sitting in a chair and across from him are several animals, okay? So we have a bird, we have a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, a fish, a seal, and what looks like a dog. The assessor is asking all of the elephants, I mean, all of the animals, I'm sorry, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So there's a tree behind all of the animals and the assessor is asking that all of the animals climb that tree for a fair selection. So if you're looking at this picture, um, you're taking it in, you're processing it, you automatically can understand that a fish would fail this exam. So would a seal um, likely an elephant and a penguin. Um, a bird may be able to be the exception and also the monkey. Maybe the dog could be the exception. However, we know that this is certainly not fair, as the assessor said, a fair selection. So this is what I want us to start thinking about as we are going about our um, daily work as developers, as programmers, um, creating a space for those who are different from us um, because we know that utilizing a standard and saying this is fair across the board is not always ethical. So I want us to really think and ponder on that. And I will have the slides available afterwards if someone wants to, to take another glance and really soak this in. So what would happen if you and I began to view ability as an intersection of our identity? or a form of diversity rather than deficiency? That's a big question, but I want you all to think about that. What would happen if we began to view ability as um, a form of diversity or an intersection of our identities rather than a deficiency? Go ahead and make a comment. Um, let me know how this world would be different, how your workplace would be different if we started to view um, ability as an intersection of our identities or a form of diversity. All right, I'll give you a moment to just really think and soak that in and uh, meditate on that, and then we're going to move right along. Um, I wanted this to be a very interactive experience. That's why I'm asking a lot of questions. It's a lot of give and take here. I feel like if I just give a sit and get, you all wouldn't thoroughly enjoy this uh, presentation. So I wanna make some space for us to really think about um, the picture we saw, think about the question that has been recited and to be able to form some opinions and some ideas around that. All right, so I'm going to move right along and I want to discuss intersectionality. So intersectionality is simply about how certain aspects of who you are will increase your access to the good things or your exposure to the bad things of life. Like many other social justice ideas, it stands because it resonates with people's lives, but because it resonates also with the way people um, view other people's lives. So this term intersectionality has become really, really popular and um, a lot of people are using it to <laughs> like a buzzword or they're using it to, to make a point. And I wanted to create an illustration that helped you to understand the word um, intersectionality. So as we see here, um, intersect intersectionality can encompass race, ethnicity, gender identity, um, language, religion, ability, um, mental health, age, education, and so many more things. Um, so many things intersect here, okay? And remember, it's just how um, certain aspects of our lives um, increase 
with the exposure to the good and the bad. It can be used in a social justice context. It can also be used just to imagine how we're creating things online. Um, who is our target market? Who will uh, be at the intersection of the work that we're doing? So when we think of intersectionality, we know that everyone exists in intersectional identities. We all have our own dynamic experiences of discrimination and privilege. Regardless if you're white or you're black or you're abled or you're disabled or you're anything in between, we know that our dynamic experiences are part of our intersectional identities. Also, we can't section people off into pieces of themselves. So that's something I want you to really ponder on um, as you are really ponder on as you are creating and developing that you can't section people off into pieces of themselves. So we're going to specifically touch on number seven, which was ability. Okay. So with ability comes that term that we're hearing, another buzzword, neurodiversity. So neurodiversity is used to refer to a variation in the human brain regarding social ability, learning, attention, mood, and other mental functions in a non-pathological sense. So what does that really mean? So neurodiversity is a way to describe the differences of the nervous system. The brain is our central computer. And since we are all developers and programmers, I definitely wanted to use the brain um, as a metaphor because um, it is our central computer essentially. Um, the rest of our nervous system is like a network that relays messages back and forth from the brain to the different parts of the body. So there's no one brain that represents the standard to which all other human brains must be compared. Therefore, things like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, um, they aren't really abnormal when we think about it. Um, they're variations of the human brain. Here are a few other variations I want you all to consider. When you are creating things online or when you are um, working amongst your team, I want you to really think about the differences um, that exist and how they can be beneficial to the project you're creating or to the project that um, you're collaboratively contributing to. So when we think about learning disabilities or learning um, disorders, we can categorize dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. Um, now, dysgraphia is going to be a disorder with, with writing, and um, dyscalculia is going to be a disorder with math, just for those who are unfamiliar with those terms. Next, we have visual um, disabilities, which can include low color, um, or low vision, rather, or hearing disabilities, like someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. Mobility could be cerebral palsy, um, neurodiversity, as we've mentioned before, could be um, autism or ADHD. And then finally, mental health, because we often um, exclude that from the entire variations we have here. And that could be anxiety, depression, and OCD, which a lot of us are seeing more and more during this pandemic. We're seeing a lot of anxiety about the Zoom meetings, about the Zoom conferences, about all of the Zooming and all of the <laughs> virtual uh, events that we are required to attend. So who benefits from a high contrast text, okay? So when we're talking about variations of neurodiversity and we're talking about creating um, ways in which our work can intersect the identities of other people, we wanna look at who can benefit from us just taking our creative natures to the next level. So when we're looking at high contrast text, someone with cataracts, which is a temporary condition, someone with snow blindness, which is a situational experience, or someone with a permanent experience like vision loss. When we're looking at who benefits from large tap areas, that can simply be someone with a broken hand, which we know is a temporary condition, um, someone who may be drunk, <laughs> and which is situational. And then finally, someone with Parkinson's disease. They can all benefit equally from large tap areas. Next, who, be who benefits from closed captions? 
I mean, we can have someone with a permanent condition, someone with a temporary condition, and someone that has a situational experience or occurrence. Like if they're on a bus or if they have really loud kids in the background, <laughs> maybe they could benefit from closed captions as well. So I wanna look at some outside factors that are important. I've been talking a lot about creating for individuals and what that would look like, but let's talk about developers. If you are a developer and you identify um, as having ADHD, autism, or dyslexia, or something within that neurodiversity scope, we can help you do your work better. Well, internet filters can be really, really helpful. They can aid you as you are anchoring in your task. So you don't see tons of pop-ups happening. You're not getting spammy alerts and notifications. You can truly focus on the work that you need to get done. Next, page simplifiers. These are another form of ways where you can focus your attention, but page simplifiers enlarge in the um, information you have in front of you, and they make it hard for um, different websites to interact with your, with your browser so that you don't have um, pop-ups again. So it's going to be another form of internet filters, but it'll simply do um, a more sophisticated job of creating everything centered so you can really hone in on that work that needs to be completed. Next, syntax checkers. This is going to be essential for those who have issues with spelling and who may have issues with um, just really comprehending what that text should look like as you're typing it. You may be a quick typer, a quick speller, and then um, you notice that you have tons of errors. Um, another two free tips that I'll give is um, text-to-speech and speech-to-text. Those two different um, platforms could be masterful in helping developers really gain that advantage and really provide the work that is on the level basis as their um, counterparts. All right, so I'm gonna give just a few recommendations that you all can consider as you are looking at interviewing or if you are a boss and you're looking at ways in which you can create a more safe space for those who fall into that neurodiversity category or for those who you notice have maybe intersections that are not being celebrated. So here are some at work ways in which we can really provide some more essential assistance for those who are neurodiverse. And, and as we know, we all have intersections. So how about hiring and interviewing should showcase the use of creative challenges and performance-based tasks? How about documenting um, objective skills and experiences over personality quirks? How about creating assignments that involve collaborative teams that mix people creatively so teammates can garner value from diverse navigations and perspectives? Finally, I have a couple other tips for us or a few other. Um, let's look at trainings that are designed to benefit the diversity of thought and to address social skills and emotional IQ. Um, when I think of performance reviews, I get a little nervous, but what about revamping those um, or company-wide procedures and policies so everyone can feel like they are being rewarded for the work that they're putting in? And finally, let's provide a clear avenue to request accommodations or workplace adjustments during the hiring process, during onboarding, and before the first day on the job. So this is catered to getting in the door, but as we know, there is more that needs to be done to keep us within that space. So our next steps, you and I, um, I'd love for you to first hop into the comments and let me know something that you think we should do next as it relates to being a more um, diverse uh, workplace, being a more inclusive developer. What are some things you think you need to do? What is on your priority list? Next steps, please. All right.
I want to give you all just a few moments to really think about what um, you should be doing. I'll talk about what I should be doing. Um, and we can use all of this intel to really shape how we move forward, how we're creating um, more diverse, more inclusive, more equitable spaces that honor all of our intersections and honoring our neurodiversities. All right, love to see those comments coming in. Really think about what your next steps could potentially be. I'll make some really simple next steps. So first and foremost, I'll say, show up. You know, the fact that you're here today tells me that you care. <laughs> and uh, as I always say, sharing is caring. And, and I'll say uh, that I've definitely taken that from my eight-year-old. So <laughs> he has a lot of other phrases like get what you get and don't have a fit. But hey, that's neither here or, no, or there. What I will say the first thing is showing up, taking up that space, and really being able to um, understand what needs to be done, what work needs to be in place. And I often think about the fact that um, this past year and a half, we've had so many protests, um, those that involve social justice, those that involve human rights. And I really acknowledge and appreciate those individuals who are just showing up because that's half the battle, okay? Next, learn what works best for you. Trial and error, my friend. If you have a neurodiversity, you would be um, in a terrible position to just go to your boss and say, hey, this doesn't work. I need something that works. Look at what works for you. So when you come to your boss, you can say, hey, this works for me better. And I would like to use this software. I would like to use this tool because this tool helps me to gain da 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 da. So you essentially want to learn what works best for you so that you can go to your employer or you can um, utilize it in the best of its um, advantages for you. Because again, you want to level that playing field. You want to be able to be your best self and you don't really know how you can be unless you try things and you fail at them. So I would highly suggest trial and error. Finally, we have to be the change that we want to see. So that may be, in, that may be inclusive of advocating for ourselves. It kind of goes back to number two. You know, when you find out what works best for you, then you can advocate for that. And you can say, hey, this is what my clients prefer or this is what helps me to work best in this particular environment. So with that in mind, those were, that's the end of my slide presentation. I am going to grab some questions from you all. I'm really excited to hear what input you have as it relates to what I just shared. And um, I'm excited. And someone still has to answer that sooner state question for me too. So, <laughs> I'd hey, love to hear I'm, any I'm questions. All right, uh, Doji, are we good to go? Yes, we are. Excellent. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay, Jeanette, thank you so much for that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Let's uh, start jumping into some of the questions. Sorry, <laughs> get it all going. Okay, so first up, uh, can you give an example of how we can check in with ourselves and about how to make sure that we are thinking about including everyone in design and web dev? Yeah, what's, what's the check-in? Love that question. I would say you want to definitely work on the front end so that you don't have to, um, on the back end of things, like after everything's completed and say, oh, well, let me see who I didn't include. So I would uh, highly suggest to maybe create a makeshift list 
and um, maybe list some common disabilities or neurodiversities and see how those can be incorporated in your work. And my window is open. I told you all I'm getting a little warm over here. So if you hear like grass cutting and things like that, just, you know, it's a part of life. <laughs> so yes, I would say create a, a checklist. It can be a functional checklist that is live and people can add to it. And just kind of go throughout that list as you are creating, as you are developing that website or as, as you are putting together the um, tools for that mobile device um, or, you know, the, the app that you are launching. Look at those things before you um, create it and then say, oh, I forgot these people. <laughs> there are checklists available online. And um, what I could do is potentially send one to the organizers and um, they can, after the conference, when maybe they send the thank yous and everything, maybe they'll include that. Absolutely. And we'll also, we can follow up in the, just the main thread for this conference as well. So we'll, we'll make okay. to link share all the things uh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No, I appreciate that. Um, okay. Next question uh, is from Tim. Uh, thinking back to the opening slide with the FAIR assessment, could you give some examples of how hiring managers can do a better job of giving FAIR assessments or providing FAIR accommodations to neurodiverse folks? Okay. Specifically, though, hiring developers and the myth of mediocrity. It's the, yeah, it's <laughs> definitely mediocrity for sure. Um, I know towards the ending slides, I documented some um, great ways in which um, hiring managers can look at really creating inclusivity in their practices. And I'll quickly go over those uh, again. So one of them is to make sure that we are not like docking points from an applicant just because they have some personality quirks. As we'll know, um, you may or may not know, individuals with autism, they tend to stem. And that stimulation that they are providing themselves could be something like tapping a pencil on the desk or, you know, moving your foot rapidly. And we certainly don't want things like that to interfere with us getting the job. Um, some other things would be to use creative challenges and performance-based tasks. Have those at the forefront because interviewing can cause a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress. So a lot of people are not good at that interview process. But if you give them that pre-work and you allow them to, um, to facilitate a, a performance-based task and, and show you how well they can execute that, then that may be a great definer and help you to isolate those beneficial characteristics and traits in a candidate. So um, again, I have a couple of those that I listed in the slides and you'll have access to those slides. Excellent. Um, I think that might be all the questions. If anyone has any more, uh, be sure to drop them in. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. When establishing a team to utilize individual talents and creativity, how would you avoid coming off as exclusive? Ooh, that's a good question. I like these words. I'm hearing mediocrity and exclusive. So um, let's say if I am creating a team, um, what I would find to be helpful, um, and I don't know if a lot of companies are using this, the current company I'm working for does, but they have a strengths finders assessment that they use for everyone. And I thought that that was so fundamental because you can understand people's strengths and then pair them with those who have different strengths. And ultimately, you can all be this strong team of collaborators who are putting this project together. So maybe a, a quick assessment, something fun, nothing scary, but to understand the strengths of each colleague and um, using that to your benefit as you're building those teams. I think something like that could be really, really helpful. Um, you don't wanna dismiss their challenges, but you wanna lead with strengths. So, um, you know, someone who has a challenge with writing um, and they have issues 
with uh, writing because it takes them a long time, then obviously if you find someone who has the strength of typing and getting those ideas down and they're great at execution, you certainly want those two to be paired together in a collaborative way, um, especially if the person who has those um, difficulties, maybe the, the strength or the benefit they have is they're great at ideating. They can come up with really quick and fast ideas. So it's really about doing a small, quick assessment to understand where everyone is and then moving forward that way. Awesome. Uh, the thread's already dropping hearts about that. That's <laughs> the perfect answer. Um, I think that's all we have. Uh, Jeanette, thank you so much for speaking. Is there a good way for people to get in contact with you? What's the, where, where can they find you online? Yeah, so um, my company is called Barely Articulating. Um, that's B-E-A-R-L-Y. Articulating is A-R-T-I-C-U-L-A-T-I-N-G. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and um, I think I'm on Tumblr and Pinterest too. So I'm kind of everywhere. Uh, you just have to Google that name or search that name and you'll cool. likely find me. We'll do some link drops uh, right up. <laughs> and I apologize, there was one more question that came in. So let's, let's oh, jump okay. in. Uh, uh, if technology can enhance someone's ability, how, if someone, if technology can enhance someone's ability, how do we avoid it from becoming the norm if everyone is using it, but no, but a few don't want to for personal reasons? Hmm. So um, that's a good question. And first and foremost, um, I would like to say all of the questions have been great. They've been making me think. And I know that if one person has that question, then it's likely other people also are, have that same question. So with this particular one, I would say that it's important to have diversity of tools as well, diversity of software that we're using. If it gets the job done, hey, let it get the job done. Um, I don't think anything should be to the point where everyone has to use it. Now, I understand some software we can't get around, you know, um, like if your company is using Asana, like you have to use Asana for um, project management. But um, if you find that you can couple that with something else, then go for it. And I think employers need to let everyone know like, hey, this is the standard that we're using. However, you can feel free to use other plugins or use other resources and bring it back to this main frame. So just being open and letting people know like this is not um, this is not to be done alone if you don't necessarily want it to use it alone and you know with exclusions to everything else. There are, other tools, and then learn about why people don't like those tools. I know that could be a private question, but I think understanding why some of your colleagues or some of your employees don't like that tool could be essentially helpful as you're building out the next stage of what you all will be using. So I think that asking those questions and not making them be stressful questions not abrasive questions, but saying, hey, we would love your feedback. What, you know, what can we do so we can all be on a similar page? Uh, one more question. Um, I'm sure. Kendall Wirtz. Hi. Um, I know a surprising number of developers who hate coding interviews. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could comment on, on coding interviews and if if, if you think they're any good or, or maybe are they, like, is it just something that shouldn't be leaned on 100% or something like that? I definitely don't think they should be leaned on 100%. Great question. Um, I do think, and, and that's the, the key term of the day is diversity. We talked about neurodiversity, tool diversity, having more in our toolbox. But when it comes to coding interviews, they are very intimidating. Um, they can be very hard. Um, they can um, elicit this false pretense of what this job will entail. Um, I don't like them personally. I think that the interview process should be have several things that are weighing on uh, hiring that potential employee. I think about um, when you're in school, 
And um, at the end of the year, your grade is based on like maybe 20% of the final exam, maybe 60% of the classwork, maybe 40% of your, your um, or like 20% of your tests and quizzes. So I think an interview should be structured like that with um, more emphasis given on that person's um, strengths outside of their challenges. I, I don't know. I, I think in my mind, I just see a different world, like where we're not solely focused on what people can't do, but we're looking at what they can do and we're taking it up a notch. We're enhancing it by investing in what they can do so they can get really well at what they can do. So I don't know, I, I live in a bubble sometimes um, because I don't understand why a lot of these employers will deny uh, access to employment based off of one thing that someone was unable to, to complete or, or do it with a particular finesse. So I don't know, I, I, I hope that through talks like these, through more, um, more listening sessions, employers will jump on that trend and start hiring people based off of their, um, their positive quirks and their, their positive attributes that they can bring to the company instead of looking at those detrimental factors. Agreed, totally. Um, uh, we do have one, uh, one question actually from, from Doji, our AV guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Security makes things harder for people that don't have neurodiversities. How mm -hmm. can security make things easier for these individuals when keeping things secure? Hmm. So that, I feel like that's layered, Doji. Um, I, I think I need more context around security because immediately I'm thinking of obviously security online, but I'm having a hard time understanding um, why people with neurodiverse backgrounds would feel like they can't be secured or um, why they wouldn't want to be secured or they maybe have issues with security. So I need a little more <laughs> context around that one. Maybe okay. a hypothetical or something. Uh, he's not adding to it right now. We might have to <laughs> we'll follow up on that one in the chat. Yeah, we can, we'll follow we can, up. We can, end it, we can end it here. Uh, okay. Thank you again so much for talking. We're so glad to have you. Uh, thanks for kicking off the conference for us. Um, and we'll, like I said, we'll put all the slides, the links uh, in the in the 200 OK channel so everyone can follow up on that. Um, and thank you again. And we'll be starting back in at 10.15 with our next talk. So we'll see you in a few. All right. Bye.